Thailand video blog for books that came out on, oh, look at that, May 27th, 2009. As always, I'm Craig, your host. Uh, although it's been a while since I've forgotten the date. That was, that was unique. I forgot how I recovered from that. May 27th, 2009 is the day we're talking about. We're going to have two installments this week. One is Marvel books, one is DC books. Uh, Mouse Guard number six came out, and I read it, and I liked it, but I don't think it necessarily warrants an entire indie uh, chapter all to itself. And we've got plenty of Marvel and plenty of DC to talk about. So let's get right down to it. Let's start with Amazing Spider-Man 595. American Sun is here. And, oh, man, that's a great Phil Jimenez cover and some great Phil Jimenez work here in general. Uh, I'm very excited for where this is going. Um, there are a lot of good plot threads just thrown out right here, you know. Let's let's go with this, that, that, and the next thing, and I'll put them all into the Spider-Man's life at the same time. Excellent, excellent stuff. This is a classic Spider-Man book. That's how Spider-Man's supposed to go. Oh, by the way, your aunt is marrying Jonah Jameson's dad, so you're going to be cousins now. Oh, by the way, uh, Harry and Norman are trying to, you know, Norman's trying to recruit Harry again. Um, oh, by the way, Menace is back, and surprise, and this isn't really a spoiler if you've seen the solicits, she's pregnant, and it's probably Harry's kid. <laughs> Might be Norman's, you never know. He seems to uh, impregnate a lot of people when, uh, when you don't realize it. <clears throat> Gwen Stacy. So, anyways, uh, part one of five, excellent stuff. American Sun looks to be very fun. Um, again, you know, with the big Spidey crossovers, I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to get all really excited for this and be like, oh, man, it's going to change everything. Because if I do, I know I'm going to be disappointed at the end. But uh, I'm going to hold on some some cautious optimism for this book because it's looking pretty good. First chapter started everything off with a bang, and I like it. Next up, also on the Spidey front, in case you didn't get enough Spidey this week, the short Halloween by Bill Hader and Seth Meyers of Saturday Night Live. Uh, this is a cute little idea. It's a 33-page book, as the cover will tell you, and it is $4, but it's well worth the $4 because it's a nice, solid, longer than a normal story, you know, um, hilarious piece of work with Spider-Man. Again, this is just kind of like that Spider-Man one-shot sort of thing. It fits anywhere, you know. This is the Spider-Man stock story. This is what they would have done in the 80s, you know, when somebody wrote one like this, they'd put it in a drawer, and when somebody was running late, they'd pull it out and they'd run this one. Which is good. It's an okay story, and, and it fits just fine, you know, with what it's doing. And, and like I said, it's hilarious. It accomplishes its job perfectly. It's nice to see, you know, another big celebrity book from Spider-Man. A couple of years back, professional wrestler Raven wrote a Untold Tales of Spider-Man, I think that was what it was called, or Tingled Web or something like that, and it was pretty good as well. So that's it for that. And that'll bring us to Dark Reign the Hood, number one of five. As uh, I mentioned in the Dark Reign the Cabal one-shot review, I was very excited for this miniseries. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have picked this up. Um, Jeff Parker writing The Hood is kind of a unique decision, I think. Um, Jeff Parker normally does more of the kid stuff, and that's kind of what I see him as. But then again, I read The Hood uh, by Brian Vaughn, the original miniseries in hardcover, and, you know, he's an interesting character, even though Bendis apparently just has this giant man crush on him and decides to use him all over the place. And I'm not entirely sure that he warrants that just yet. But this is another solid Hood miniseries, you know, really gets into who the character is, what he's struggling to do, and now uh, with the story of Dormammu kind of sneaking in on him and dealing with Dark Reign at the same time, it looks to be a very interesting miniseries. Um, is it necessarily Dark Reign? Uh, other than the fact that the Hood is in the Cabal, probably not. I don't think that's really going to be the, uh, the need for the tag on the cover, but it's going to be there anyways just because he is, and that's where it is, and Bendis put him in there because, again, Bendis is Man Crush. Still a very good book, very interesting. Um, nice to see you know this interesting dynamic, this new little look at this glimpse of the corner of the Marvel Universe that we're not really seeing right now. So really good stuff as usual. Um, Jeff Parker writes a great book anyways, but a parental advisory book by Jeff Parker is just kind of strange. Uh, next up, Guardians of the Galaxy number 14. And if you're not reading War of Kings, I I think this is really all you need to read to get War of Kings, uh, or it seems like its own little mini War of Kings off to the side, which is funny because Abnett and Lanning are writing War of Kings, and they're also writing Guardians of the Galaxy, and they're writing this, you know, separately. This is a lot of setup, um, a lot of fights, a lot of the Guardians of the Galaxy really doing what they do, you know, which is ridiculous things to each other, around each other, and then reacting like 
are you kidding me? Why did you do that? You know, this is the classic non-team formula that the Guardians of the Galaxy are supposed to be uh, using right now, and it works perfectly here. You know, we have Phyla going crazy and taking Crystal hostage, and everybody's kind of going, why did you do that? That's it's Crystal of the Inhumans. That's a terrible idea. And um, it, it works, you know, it works very well. It's just organized chaos, which is what I really liked about this book when it started. You know, they've obviously gotten back to the briefing room panels where it's just people being interviewed after, after the fact about what happened there. It's very, very nice. It's, it's another solid book from the Guardians of the Galaxy. I know we, the quality had kind of dipped recently, but we're getting back up into good stuff. Hopefully when this War of Kings is over soon, it it's, it's, feels like it's been going on for a long time at this point with all of the build up to it. Hopefully it's over soon and we can go on to having more fun adventures with the Guardians of the Galaxy other than with the Kree and the Shi'ar over and over again. Ultimate Wolverine vs. Hulk number 6 ended. And um, that's about all I gotta say about it. It ended. Uh, I don't think it ended well and I don't think it ended poorly. I just think it ended. It's here. It's done. You've waited three years probably to read it. Read it. It'll be okay, and it'll be forgettable. This book's definitely dropped in the amount of importance it had. When Ultimate Wolverine vs. Hulk number one came out, it was a very important book. By the time this book comes out, it's mediocre at best. This is a throwaway Hulk Wolverine miniseries. The only reason that we know it's in the uh, Ultimates universe is mentions of the Triskelion and Ultimate Nick Fury showing up. And if Nick Fury was a white guy and they just called it the S.H.I.E.L.D. Helicarrier, this book could have been a story told at any time in any, in any universe. It would have just been done. It wouldn't have really mattered all that much. Um, with that said, you know, Lineal Yu delivers great drawing and Damon Lindelof does some really fun writing here. And there's, there's a scene on an airplane and I just was looking back to Lindelof and expecting another Lost reference since we got the Dharma Crackers in the last one. But nope, we didn't. There was no, we uh, didn't draw Matthew Fox in the corner or anything like that. Um, there might be a Howard the Duck, though, I heard. Lenial Yu likes to do that. Uh, really, it, it's, there's nothing to complain about here, but again, it's just Ultimate Wolverine vs. Hulk. It's, uh, it could have been so much more, but obviously, four years later, it's now not. Lastly, for this installment, oh yeah, Old Man Logan, number 72. Blue Goblin dared me. <laughs> By the way, Blue Goblin is now available on Facebook. Uh, send him a message on YouTube and he can uh, hook you up with his video on Facebook if you want to watch it there. Um, he dared me to say a bad thing about this book other than the fact that it took forever. And I think I found something bad to say about it. It's not done! I waited so long for this to end and I thought, alright, part seven. You know, Millar and McNiven write good seven-part stories. I read Civil War, and despite all the fanboy grousing, it was an all-right miniseries. And this has been just phenomenal. Knocked it out of the park. We're getting to the penultimate chapter. Let's wrap it up right now. No. We've got to wait for a giant-sized Old Man Logan, number one, which we'll wrap this up later. Didn't Marvel learn from DC that this is a terrible idea to just go, okay, well, you know, the story's running really long, so we're just going to put a different creative team on the book, and then, uh, and then whatever we would have published as the end, the last part, we're just going to publish as a one-shot. It's a bad decision. It's just, it, it smacks of poor taste. It's a great cover, though. I, I, I love this cover. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't get enough of that Red Skull wearing Captain America suit. And it is another excellent issue. Uh, I don't think I have to tell you that. You should still be reading this. Uh, if you're not reading this, I would say wait for the trade, but you've got to wait for another issue to come out before the trade is even solicited. So let's hope it gets moving shortly. That's it for the Marvel installment. We'll see you in a little bit with the DC books.